Okay, so we are switching things up a little bit today. Um, we usually have one speaker, but when we heard the word end, we knew we wanted to search the city for the gritty and hardworking entrepreneurs that have experienced both blissful and stressful ends. We quickly decided that we couldn't just decide on one, so we decided to opt for a panel discussion. So I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Letitia Lipscomb, who will be leading our discussion. Letitia is a Grand Rapids native who has a passion for working hard to better the lives of the underprivileged in the city's urban core. For the last two years, she has served as the community engagement project manager, facilitating the Heartside Quality of Life study for the City of Grand Rapids Planning Department. When she isn't busy being an advocate for those with unheard voices, you can find her running her cosmetics company, I Got Face, coordinating Women Who Wine, and you may have even seen her on your television as part of the WOTV4 Women's Crew. Needless to say, Leticia is a busy gal, and we are so happy that she gave us her time today. So let's all give her a round of applause, and I'd like to invite all the panelists up to the stage, and let's get this discussion going. <laughs> beautiful people how's everybody doing good I think you can do a little bit better than that good morning beautiful people yes all right let's get this party started so like she mentioned my name is Letitia Lipscomb and what an honor and a privilege it is to be before you um, this morning I'm super excited to moderate this um, panel discussion and thank you so very much for reading my bio if you guys think anything of me I'm sure you are going to be equally impressed by these amazing uh, creative panelists so just in case you didn't have a chance to read their bios or know um, how they're connected to today's creative morning, I'm going to ask that our panelists just say their name and state their agency, and then we're going to hop right into some good conversation. How does that sound? All right, so let's start here. Tell everybody your name and let them know what your creative agency is. Hi, everyone. I'm Kayla, um, also the host and was roped into this by my lovely team <laughs> to do this panel discussion. Um, I own a creative agency here in Grand Rapids called Docs Design, where we do branding and websites for pet businesses. Awesome. Hello, I'm Jamel Eddy. I am the uh, co-founder and owner of Malamaya Juice Bar. I also do uh, some business coaching and consulting, and then I'm also the co-founder and owner of Team Eddy. That's my household. <laughs> The mo most important job. Right. Uh, I'm Laura Vaughn with Blackbird RSVP, and we do online invitations for events. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> um, yeah, I also do. I also do some consulting on uh, the marketing side. I think that's a theme that I'm sure we'll get into. But there's a lot of also's in starting a, a business. My name is Kara Allen. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am the owner of True to Size Shoes. It is an online shoe store, and we specialize in catering to women wearing all sizes, five through 13. Yes, give it up for the woman with the big feet. <laughs> that applies to me. Um, all right, so I, when I was asked to do this, and I heard that the theme was end, I was like, ooh, Mufasa. I was like, yes, there are so many different ways you can think about the word end. And so given the fact that our theme today is end, we, I assure you, we are going to get there and we're going to talk about endings. But before we do, I would like to talk about beginnings because those are the beautiful parts of an end. And so every creative entrepreneur, or every creative has to start from somewhere, right? So I'd like for you guys to tell us how you began getting out your dream. And let's start with you, Care, and work our way on down the line. Um, so mine, um, I went through a program called Spring GR. Um, and I, I'm sure it's not foreign to any of you, but uh, Spring GR, if you don't know, Spring GR is basically a 12-week program for startups, entrepreneurs, even people in the idea phase to kind of get you going um, on your entrepreneurial journey. Um, and they do two um, programs a year. Um, one in the spring and one in the fall. So I did Spring GR and I went with one idea because I do some fashion styling and I was like, I want to do that full time. That's going to be my thing. Um, and I met with my business coach and he was like, yeah, you're good at it, but is that, what you, is that the, the issue that you're truly solving? And I was like, no, not really. And so we, he just kind of like talked me through it. He's like, tell me your pain points. Tell me some of the things that you've heard from 
uh, other people in the community? What, what is the thing that drives you? And I was like, well, I gained quite a bit of weight at one point in my life. And I was like, that was my biggest struggle. Um, in 2010, I gained 90 pounds from stress and depression. Um, and I was supposed to be living my best life. I was in college. I was thriving. I was the first person um, to leave my home and do something successful, right? Um, but I was really, really stressed out. And from that, not only did I gain a ton of weight, my feet grew. And I'm a fashionista. I was like, wait a minute now. Um, I don't. I can't find any cute shoes. I wear an 11. I was like, why don't they make cute shoes for folks like me? Um, and I started to hear this same um, kind of theme from other women. I started to hear this theme from um, people in the transgender community. I started to hear like. I want to be stylish, I want to be fashionable, but I am stuck in combat boots. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what, let's solve that. So I brought that to my business coach, and my business coach was like, that's what you want to do. You want to solve that issue. That's that's what you see. You see that there's a gap in the market um, for women who want to wear stylish shoes but don't have standard sizes or widths. Um, so basically, Spring GR brought it to life for me, and this was an idea in my head at week one. Um, I pitched on my birthday last year, June 7th. Uh, and I won the pitch competition and my business opened in September. So it was like fast. So that's my journey, the short version. Awesome. Um, so my uh, story really starts like eight years ago, I think. I was planning my wedding and I had just been used to, I graduated college in 2009, like right at the, the, when the economy was so great. And uh, I had to, I've just always been used to being really creative about how I make money. I think you kind of had to be uh, back then. And I was planning my wedding and I was looking for um, a wedding website to collect RSVPs and they were all really uh, ugly. They looked like a web developer, no offense, uh, like de <laughs> designed them. They were like, oh, girls like flowers, we'll put flowers on here. This was back before like Squarespace and all of that. Uh, so we started doing wedding website templates to collect RSVPs, and a few years later, oh, we got some funding from Start Garden. Uh, that's how we how we did all of that, and then um, people started signing up to use it for corporate events. So we kind of, I thought that's a way better uh, business. <laughs> um, so kind of pivoted to start doing that. Uh, we launched our first. It was a long journey getting here, but about three years ago we launched our our actual product. Um, to do that for sort of all events. So now we do, we still do weddings, we do baby showers, but we also do corporate events uh, for companies like Adidas and Facebook and Stark Garden even. So it's been a, a quite a journey to get here. Well, for me, and the question was, how do you get your, how do you get your dream out? For me, my dream was simple. My dream has been to um, uplift and inspire uh, the community, uplift and inspire specifically the communities of color. And so therefore, how do I walk that out is um, a business. And so Malamaya Juice Bar um, originally uh, came to existence because we wanted to help decrease the health disparities in, in the black and brown community. Um, as we um, started, when we launched our business a year, two years in, we realized that's something that we can't do by ourselves. And so we kind of changed our mission to partner with other organizations that also have some, uh, a similar mission. And that way we can do that um, all together. So. So my beginning was kind of a happy accident. Um, I left post-grad life pretty sure of what I was gonna do. I had my whole career path um, kind of paved out for me and within my first year I realized what I thought I was gonna do, be a junior designer, move to a senior designer, be a creative director, was just not the way I worked. <laughs> um, as someone who can't stand still, being in an office setting just wasn't helping me thrive mentally, it wasn't helping me thrive creatively. So here I was post-grad with my very expensive degree, I just bought thinking, how am I going to use this? And life is not what I thought it was going to be. So kind of out of necessity, um, I started doing what I call passion projects on the side. And for me, what I'm passionate about is animals. Um, I was volunteering at animal shelters, and um, that's kind of where I first started, that there was um, a local shelter who needed some help with their marketing and branding. And I was really passionate about that, and I was able to use my skill set that for something meaningful. And um, from there, it kind of just spiraled out of control, and I realized that there was this niche in the design community 
community that people were not meeting, and this was these what we call petpreneurs and pet businesses. Um, when I first told everyone, like, I'm only good design for pet businesses, a lot of people thought I was crazy. They're like, you're taking crazy dog lady to a whole new level. Um, and, but there, there really was a need for it. So um, what started as a passion project kind of turned into freelancing, and next thing I know, I'm filing an LLC um, for my agency, Docs Design, and um, with a lot of planning, I was able to realize that I could pave my own path in the creative community, and I didn't have to follow the traditional sense um, to get to where I was going. Very, very good. So what I'm discovering is that a lot of you share um, the same passion and purpose, or being able to find your passion and purpose throughout your work. So as a creative, sometimes it's hard to figure out what that thing is that drives you. For instance, when I graduated from law school, I put myself on the trajectory to a mayor of Chicago and defeat the Daily Dynasty, right? I was going to do that thing. And then I was placed in a position where I was a political liaison for a mega church. And I was like, oh, hell to the <laughs> There truly is not a separation between church and state. This is not where I'm supposed to be. And so it kind of forced me to walk into or to find my purpose driven life was just doing a little bit of creative stuff on the side. So I always encourage people to make sure that you're digging down deep when you're considering your next steps and that you are really truly actively pursuing your purpose driven life. But given that, sometimes there can be some speed bumps. And so I want to ask you specifically, Jermaine, if there was something that ended in your life or if there was some sort of breaking point or turning point in your personal life or journey that led you to start now. Um, yes, actually there was, and, and one, I'll say this, that I'm a firm believer that how you, um, how you end something, how you end a season, how you end a relationship, how you end whatever that thing is, is exactly how you're going to enter into the next phase. And so be careful on how you end something because it will affect the next thing that you're going to walk through. So if you, if you end running from something, you're going to be running into something else, and that could be um, a roadblock. But anyhow, for me, um, I was in a job for a while where uh, it was, in my mind, I say it was like a dead-end job. It was a dead-end job. I was there for two years, and I had two great benefits. One was insurance for my family, and two, it allowed me to pay my mortgage. That was it. I'm sitting making phone calls all day. Um, I'm sitting at a desk all day. And you know, if you left the desk and didn't make phone calls and for five or 10 minutes, they'd be like, where were you? And it's like, oh, I was in the bathroom. Like, you know, they wanted to know everything <laughs> if you weren't making phone calls. And so my wife, who uh, at the time was a school social worker, and she would probably say that I was um, kind of on the border of, uh, of depression, if you will, just again, day in and day out, a job I didn't like. And um, she was like, I need you to, you should put your two weeks in, but I didn't have anything. Put your two weeks in, I didn't have anything. And so, it, but it was in this job that I was introduced to the concept of, of, of making juice and juicing. And around the same time, we both felt like God was, God was nudging us or nudging me to, to leave my job and to start a juice bar. I had never been to a juice bar, didn't have any business experience, didn't know anything about the industry. Um, and decided, okay, that's what I would do. So submitted my two weeks, and about nine to 12 months later, opened the juice bar, and that was six years ago. So there you go. Wow, you know, when you were speaking earlier, it made me think of that song by Erica Badu. Right. you gonna hurt your back. And then, you know, but it's funny because that song talks about entering into a relationship with all that stuff, all that junk, all that mess, all that extra baggage. And so I think there's a lot of truth to what you said that how you begin is how you want to begin. So we have to be very careful and mindful of how we're in the term. Blackbird, yeah. Was there any substantial in your life or any end that contributed to your Yeah, so I spent, is this on? Low battery. Low battery. Eris. <laughs> um, so when I've worked since college at a lot of different startups, doing uh, marketing and sales, 
and it led to a very, uh, you know, you just never know what's going to happen. Are they going to shut down, run out of funding, get acquired? It's very um, up and down. And I was working for a startup that summer that I got married uh, in Chicago, and I was commuting down from Grand Rapids like for four days a week. And um, it was like a crazy, the, the job itself was very volatile. The personalities just weren't, didn't, I did not get along with. And I was working like crazy hours. And just hit a point where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go get married. I'm going to go on my honeymoon. And I'm going to come back and figure out what to do next. And I came back and I quit, I quit that job. And I sat, we had just moved into this temporary apartment because we were considering moving down to Chicago. So it was a very weird time. I was just like writing thank you notes from my couch and uh, watching like Dawson's Creek, I think had just <laughs> come, come back on uh, whatever streaming service it, it came onto. And uh, thinking about what was next. And in the back of my head, I had had this wedding idea that I'd work I was working on. Um, we prototyped it with my wedding website. So, uh, and then Stark Garden had kind of started this fun new funding cycle um, back then. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to do this. I think without that space, I would not have gone forward with it. Um, it just gave me that mental space to say, hey, I'm ready to try something new. So it's so important, right, to identify when relationships or situationships are toxic in our lives. And it's very important that we pull or find that courage from somewhere to, to move on and push forward and push through. And the other thing I think is really important, too, um, that I'm hearing a lot of our panelists have kind of learned is having a champion in the community. Right? that provides platforms and opportunities for creators and entrepreneurs to effectively get out of their dreams. So whether that's Start Guard, whether that's 5 by 5 whether that's Spring GR, whatever it is, we have to take advantage of those platforms in order to push forward and push through. So I want to kind of transition a little bit, and I think that what you're doing with your pet project is so incredibly amazing. And because you discovered such an interesting niche market, I would assume that you're pretty busy all of the time. So can you talk to us a little bit about how you maintain work-life balance? Yeah, so um, I don't. <laughs> That's something I uh, have gotten better on. Um, I think it's really hard when you're a one-man entrepreneur, um, especially for me, I work from home. So the lines of work and life get a little blurred and it's hard to really define the end of this is the end of the work day, especially when you have your email on your phone and it's so easy to check it when you're at dinner. Um, I think I quickly realized within the first year that burnout is real and um, it's not healthy mentally to be doing that. Um, so out of necessity, I kind of was like, I just have to set boundaries. Um, I don't always do the best with following them, but I think it is really important if you are a one person entrepreneur or if you are someone who works from home to really have that space that is your workspace. Um, just getting an at home office helped me a ton. I wasn't working from my couch anymore. I had a dedicated space to go to, which was like, this is my work time. And when I'm out of here, it is not my personal time and really setting boundaries that when it is five, sometimes six, sometimes seven, that it is time to get out of the office and enjoy life. Um, so I think it's really important to have those boundaries, whether it's just a dedicated space you go to to do your work or to have that dedicated time where it is your cutoff time, where it is the end of the work day and it is the start of you being able to enjoy the freedom that you've given yourself being an entrepreneur. I can totally agree with that. I'm a horrible at work life balance. As a single mom, there's so many things that I'm juggling, but for some reason I pride myself in trying to be a jill of all trades. And so, you know, it gets difficult sometimes as a single mom to juggling all of those balls in the air. Karen, can you tell us a little bit about how you went to work life balance? What strategies do you suggest some of our audience um, members maybe can describe to or start in their own lives? So my story is unique because I still work full time. Um, so I am um, in a world of chaos at times. Um, but one of the things that I do is, one, I get up early. I do not like to get up early. Oh my goodness. The morning was the worst. The worst. I got up, this morning I got up at 4.30 because I'm, I'm dedicated to being a healthier human. Um, so I went to the gym and I am sleepy. Um, but... Um, <laughs> But 
Um, so I get up early and I maximize on my time. So one of the things that I do, because I do still work um, full time, but let me, with a caveat, I have an awesome supervisor. So I work a very flexed schedule. Um, I actually went into this position. I quit my job back in November and I got a new job just out of happenstance. I was going to just go full time entrepreneur. I was like, God will make it do what it do. That's what I said. Literally, I walked home and I said, babe, I quit my job. God's going to have to make it do what it do. And he just looked at me like, what? And I was like... <laughs> We in this thing now, but anyway, I had applied for some jobs previously, and I ended up getting this job earlier this year. Um, and the reason I got the job, actually, I was qualified, but my supervisor said to me, "You have an entrepreneurial spirit." I hadn't even talked about being a business owner in the interview or anything. They were like, "You have an entrepreneurial spirit," and that's what we were looking for. So I was like, "Did you know I was an entrepreneur?" He was like, no. So we talked about that, and I was like, I want to take this job, but I would love to be able to have a flex schedule. So I'm able to be here today because I don't work on Fridays. Um, so things like that, um, they were really, really able to accommodate me. So I run my business, but then I advocate for myself. So I would say the biggest thing is, one, I get up early, and two, in, when I need to, I advocate for myself because being an entrepreneur is work all the time. And if you don't advocate for yourself in whatever space you're in, you won't be able to balance life and work. And if you have children or if you have a family or even a pet um, or just like a commitment to an organization or a church or something. So I advocate for myself in every single space. I say, I'm willing to do this. I'm not willing to do this. Or I am willing to do this with this. Um, and I, I have to make those lines clear. And you do it from a place, you know, once people get to know you and stuff too, you do it from a place of love. Like I'm not mean to people but I've learned to say no. Um, I've learned to say not yet or not now. Um, and then I've also learned to go into spaces that fuel my business. So even though I'm not selling shoes in this space right here, being able to pour into you all continues to motivate me to go back home and continue to do the work that I've been doing. Um, so I would say those are the things you do. Get up early, advocate for yourself, and learn to say yes, no, not now, maybe. Oh, <laughs> Well, it does take um, practice, but for me, I do pro probably every morning, at least six days a week now, uh, what I would consider to be a, a mini vacation. And what that means is that I get up at 6 a.m. every morning, automatically, no alarm clock, no nothing. 6 a.m., get a cup of coffee, and then I just sit on the recliner. I might sit on my front porch. Just got my deck redone, so I might sit on the back now. Uh, <laughs> Enjoy that investment. Um, but I just sit, and, and the purpose of it is to slow down before you start, right? Isn't that interesting? Like, slow down before you go. And so, so coffee, and I may be meditating. I may be reading a scripture. I may just sit and do nothing. Like, in, you know, in the mornings where it doesn't get um, light that early, I might just light a candle and just sit in that candlelight and I just watch the flicker um, and, and, and allow that to re-energize me. Or I might be listening to jazz. Um, what I've learned is as, I get, as I get older is that I am appreciating slowing down. There was a season where, including in that slowdown, I started doing pour over coffee. So instead of having the timer set in the morning, get my coffee and go, doing a pour over automatically made me slow down and, and really appreciate life. And so now as I sit and think about this slow down process, I'm sitting on the porch and I'm noticing how calm the neighborhood is. I'm noticing, um, you know, birds, I'm noticing squirrels, you know, things like that, that I'm just like, you know, when did I get into bird watching you know? <laughs> but the reason many of us don't get into those things is because we're too busy. If you're, if you're too busy to sit down and enjoy your cup of coffee, then you're too busy. If you're so busy that you're warming up that cup of coffee in the microwave time and time again, you're too busy. If you are yelling at your children or those around you because you're stressed about deadlines, you are too busy. 
on the other side of that too, I spend a lot of my time, not a lot of my time, I spend a decent amount of time apologizing. And what I mean by that is apologizing to my kids. You know, if I'm snapping at them in the morning or, in the, you know, they're moving slow and I'm like, come on, we got to go, we got to go. It's not their fault. It's, it's my fault for trying to cram in so much in a short period of time that they are the ones who are, are they're the benefactors of that stress. And so I have to realize that, that if I slow down, then I can help them enjoy their best life. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely that space where I'd come home from my honeymoon and I, I sat unemployed, piecing together work for six months was a really like dark space um, to move through. And in general, though, one, one uh, hard time in our, our businesses past is when I had started Blackbird, a lot of the thing that you did was you went and you raised venture funding. That's how people are that's how they're jumping into a full-time role doing their startup. You know, they're not, it, it takes a while to ramp up income to pay for yourself. And so I had been, you know, pitching investors and, and I was gonna go that route and raise a bunch of money. And uh, it was a hard, it was just, it's, it's, that's a really rough road and it's not something, you know, living with people that, that go through that, it's not, it's not for everybody and it's certainly not for me. And that was a really hard time where I was like, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with my idea? Um, and it wasn't a clean, uh, I had to sort of say, I'm done with this. I can't keep like putting myself out there and pretending like this is an option for me because I knew it wasn't, you know? I was sort of, I felt like I was pretending. So moving from that space, it was a real transition point. Um, and I think you dip your toes in the water, right? Like it's sometimes you don't always jump fully onto a new, have the courage to do this new thing. But you know, like it's it's it's, it's it was a better space for me to say, you know what, I'm going to keep consulting to pay my bills, and I'm going to start this thing. It lessens the risk for me, and also allows me to do what I want to do. Um, 
so last year, uh, last year was a highlight of my life. Um, I was living the dream. Um, I got married, we bought a house, we traveled the world, I started a business, it was the bomb. Um, and then November came around and I was in a job that literally, um, I wasn't able to advocate for myself or my students. I work in higher education, and I'm a huge advocate in particular for students of color. Um, as a first generation college student, I was like, we don't get here by chance. Like, it take a lot of work for us to come up in here every single day and deal with folks. Um, and I was not allowed to advocate for my students and I had to draw the line. I was like, this is what I get up for. This is what I'm still paying for. Like, I have a degree that I was still paying for and I come in here and work for y'all and y'all literally are not listening to the voices that are spending money at your institution right now, the people who are walking this campus every single day. Um, and I remember walking into a meeting and I had took the students, I'm gonna just say it, I took the students to see Lion King on Broadway. Um, we had funding to do the, it was, we were supposed to take, pretty much invest in a new experience for students. So I took a poll with my students and I said, what's something you've never done? And I had a list of things. And the highest thing that ranked on it was they had never been to a Broadway play. The Lion King had came. I said, oh, I gotta take them to the Lion King. Um, they called me into a meeting and they said, why did you take the students to see Lion King? And I said, well, it was a Broadway play. A lot of the students had never been to the Broadway. And they said, well, we think that that play caters to a certain audience. And I said, I'm sorry, but three years ago, the same organization took students to see Wicked. And they said, that's different. I walked out. I said, I can't, I can't work in a place that's going to tell me that seeing The Lion King is detrimental, but seeing Wicked is different. Um, it caters to a certain audience. Um, so I, put in, I did put in some notice, but I was like, I can't do this. And my heart was broken for my students, and I think that that the push that really drove me was like, you are in the business of advocating for, for folks. You are in the business for standing up for what you believe in. You are in the, you wear big shoes. You have big, big shoes to fill. Like literally that is my mantra and my motto. Like you do the work, like you, you step hard when you step. Um, and I have to live that out every single day. So I think the moment that I realized that the people who were getting the big bucks weren't there for the people who were paying the big bucks um, was the moment that I realized that I have to cut, like, cut and cut my losses here and move on to the next journey. And um, I had two months of kind of, of hard times, not even necessarily financially, but mentally. I played that scenario over and over and over again in my head and I cried and I cried and I said, how can you say something like that about students? In particular, you, I mean, you pretty much just said students of color don't deserve this. It's pretty much what you said. Um, and that's what drove me. Um, and then after those two months, January rolled around, I was like, you gotta get your life together. And I did, I got my life together and the next thing I know, I'm getting calls for the position that I'm in now. True to size shoes is onto a whole nother level. Like I'm getting to speak at stuff like this all within a matter of shifting my mindset and moving out of a toxic, toxic environment um, is kind of what, that was my end right there. Yeah, for me personally, it was a mindset that I had to end. Um, as I mentioned a little earlier, um, being a creative, um, in, in my college specifically, they drilled one traditional path that you had to take and alternate paths were not discussed. It was, you're gonna work in an agency, you're gonna work in house and that's gonna be your life. Um, and so I had that in my mind of what I was supposed to do for four years and when I graduated and realized that that wasn't what I wanna do, I kind of had a 
quarter life crisis um, and was really in my own head and it was just not a good time mentally for me. I was like, I thought I knew what I was doing with my life and now I don't. So for me, it was really shifting that mindset of what a creative is and realizing that there are other creatives out there. Um, Molly Jacks is a big one. I always draw inspiration on Spruce Road. There is a lot of these women out there um, that I was seeing on social media who are really forging their own path and they were saying, we are ditching the traditional way to make it and we're gonna make it our own way. And I think as soon as I was able to change that mindset and I always struggled with, oh, I'm not a real designer if I don't work in house or if I work in an agency and I, not a real entrepreneur because I'm a designer. So I felt like I was in that weird middle ground where I was like, I don't fit into one category or the own, so I'm gonna kind of start my own category. And as soon as I was able to shift that mindset and realize that being a creative entrepreneur is a thing, um, I was really able to thrive in my business. So I know um, there was a point in my life where I was like, okay, I've got to end my relationship with donuts. So <laughs> I called Jamil and I was like, I want to get healthy, right? I'm old. I had Kaius when I was 32. I am now 40 years old. And I'm like, I've got to get my life together. I have to get some of this weight off my bones. And so he worked closely with me gave me everything I needed to set me up for success. And I did really good for a while. And then I went back to Fago Break. <laughs> and Captain Crunch. And so I, I'm a work in progress, keep praying for me. And so I just want Jermail to just speak a little bit about health and when you felt like at what point in your life securing health and, and making sure people in the community were educated about health was an end for you so that you decided to look at it in other people's lives and in your own? Well, um, I would say that for me personally, even in the business industry that I'm in, you know, health is still a struggle for me um, because I, I feel that I place my business in other people's health ahead of mine and running the business, running the business. You know, last night, yesterday I had two events that I was at back to back and I got home at 9.30 and like, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten since noon, right? And so, you know, that's, that's the decision. I'm, okay, what am I gonna eat? Am I gonna have this apple? Or, you know, am I gonna bring out this chicken and this, this, or this rice and this and this and this? So that was the decision, you know, that I had, that you have to live with depending on what you, what you decide. Um, but, you know, for me, from an educational perspective, when it comes to the community, um, you know, what I noticed when it applies to health is that the health industry overall has left out communities of color. Overall has left out communities of color. When you think about food, when you think about restaurants, you go somewhere, folk are eating quinoa and this, that, or the other. And no, I don't want the, that bland quinoa. But if you say, here's some quinoa that has a Jamaican jerk seasoning on there, then that's different. If you say, hey, you know, we got steamed broccoli. No, I don't want the steamed broccoli. <laughs> but if you tell me, here's some steamed broccoli, you know, with some curry, you know, on there, that's totally different. And so for me, the education piece for me has been educating um, individuals on the fact that health comes in all colors. Right? So I want you all to hear that health comes in all colors. Health comes in all colors. That's also a tagline of ours now um, from um, the UICA um, event that we did a while back. But health comes in all colors. Yeah. And so the fact that certain individuals don't see themselves in the health food industry does not mean that it's not for them. Also, we don't use the phrase clean eating, clean diet. Is that clean food? Because if people with means and wealth are eating clean food, what is it that the working class or those who don't have means, what are they eating? Are they eating dirty food? So I'm going to encourage everybody in here, I, do not use the phrase clean. When you're thinking of phrases, don't use clean eating, clean diet, clean anything. You know, it, it's, it's food is what it is. And so I, I want to encourage folk, um, you know, in the community to know that it's for them, that healthy eating is for them, yes. that, that, that the health mindset is for them that they are not left behind, they are not left out. So let's talk. You know, what, what is it that I can help you with? What are some of your goals? What do, you know, do you, is, it, is it obesity? Is it um, high blood pressure? Is it, 
you know, consistent mig migraines. Is it this or is it that? Do you know someone who deals with that? And I want to help you do that. But then the flip side of what, what I do also in the, from the consulting realm, though, is like, let me help you with your business. Get this business going. Um, because, again, business and entrepreneurship is for you. Whoever you are is for you. Now, I know when you go through Grand Rapids, you see the usual suspect names on buildings. You see the usual suspects, you know, with their um, pictures on, on Facebook and social media who got a raise, who's the new CEO of this. But that is for you, too. Um, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, um, women overcoming the barrier that, that men have been in for, for, for generations and decades, or whether it's, you know, people of color moving into these spaces and whatnot. All of this is for you. And so everything that we do, I can tell you that it's on the foundation of love. Love for humankind and love for our community. And so, you know, when we talk about, you know, ending, my thing is we're going to end the mindset, that oppressive mindset, because I believe that the answer to liberation and no matter what you feel bound up is, is best conceived and the steps are best kept in the minds of those who are oppressed. So the, those who are oppressed, they know what it's like to, or, or what's needed to, to be liberated. It's like, you know, those who uh, are in the inner city perhaps know what's needed from a policy perspective to make their life better, not the politicians, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but again, so we're just talking, you know, ending, ending a certain mind mindset in social construct um, is essentially what I'm doing. I just have a few different vehicles to get that point across. That is awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. You know, the importance of renewing your mind is just critical, right? Because how we think about things really uh, determines the outcome of whatever we're investing our time and energy into. So I think that was very good, very profound. I'm going to challenge each of you. I don't know where my timekeeper is. Um, okay, good. I'm gonna challenge each of you to answer this question in like 30 seconds or less. But I'm a firm believer that sometimes we have to make a pointed effort to find the joy in in certain situations. We have to find the joy um, in dark places and spaces, and we have to find the joy in an end. And so in 30 seconds, can you tell us each, we'll start with you, Care, how do you find the joy in an end? Um, well, spiritually, um, joy comes in the morning. So um, at the end of a day, at the end of a night, you're able to put down your burdens you're able to rest, or you should be resting. Um, just because you're an entrepreneur, you should still rest. Um, so I think of that every morning as a new day. I think of the same thing with an end. I get to put down my burdens, I get to rest, and I get to start anew with new joy, with new experiences the next day or the next experience, whatever that is. So that's my constant reminder, is to put it down, and whatever you're going into the next day, you're not carrying those same burdens, or at least not in the same way. Yes, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think with enough space, you can basically turn any end into something that you learned and feel good about it. I think you ha it has to actually end, and then you need some space to ref reflect on it. Um, but that job that I had in Chicago that was so bad, um, I remember, even now, like, I've, I learned so much in that time. And not even about, like, actual, like, job skills and a lot of things. And so I think you, it's hard right away because you're, you're mad about, sometimes you're mad or sad about something ending. Uh, but reflecting back and thinking about, you know, what I'm taking from that now that I never would have gotten another way. Nice. Good job. Um, for me, I think... Um, you know, if there's a barrier or a boulder that blocks the path of, of what you were going, you know, the direction you were going, that journey's ending. But I say, you know, pull out some tools. Everybody has a tool in their tool belt and build steps into that boulder and take that to the next level. Because I'm a firm believer that all things work together for good. So no learning um, goes unused. And then, and then secondly, you know, I think that that, that, that ending um, is essentially um, planting a seed. So everything that we're doing is, is a seed. And, and, and the best way to reap the benefits of that is the harvest. And so there's a, a Mexican proverb that says that they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. Right? Yes. And so I, I believe in that, that so many things out there try to take you out, try to bury you, maybe as people, situations, but use that as a fertilizer to help you grow. And so the, the end of, of something growing is that a seed has to die in order for it to sprout new life. Come on. I'm 
I'm sorry. Yeah, wow. Okay. <laughs> Mexican proverb, <laughs> they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. Love Some, that, Somebody yeah. write that down. I don't know how I follow that. Um, <laughs> kind of going off what Laura said, I find joy in an ending, because as cliche as it sounds, it's, I look at it as a new beginning, and being able to reflect that that ending happened for a reason. It was meant to teach me something in my life to reflect on that. What did it teach me, and to bring that into my next beginning? Awesome. Come on, 15 seconds. Yes. That means I got a little bit more time to just push one more thing in. So I'm going to keep the mic there and you can just pass it on down. I kind of admit, I will admit, I kind of hate this question because I swear they asked Aaliyah this question and then she had that plane crash. <sighs> but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. All right. I'm going to do it. So I'm, I'm going to do it thinking of, uh, I know, right? I'm going to do it thinking of Thanos, right? We're going to talk a little bit about the end game, right? So we're going to snap everybody back if it is a plane crash. So what is, your, what is your end goal? And what legacy do you want to leave behind? Yeah, um, there's kind of two parts to that. Um, well, one part of my business is design. So I hope that I can inspire younger designers to realize that they don't have to take the traditional path and that you don't have to take all the steps to get to where you're going. You can forge your own path. And if you pursue something you're passionate about, you can turn it into a full-time business. Um, the second part of my business is dogs and animals, obviously. So I'm very passionate about animal shelters and helping um, animals in need. So I hope to continue to work with those nonprofits and use my skill sets and help them with marketing so they can do what they do best, which is help animals and help pets. Yes, good job. Um, for me, um, I, you know, I just want to inspire. I want to inspire. I want to leave a legacy um, so that others can say that, you know, if, if, if he did it, I can do it. And so I recognize I'm standing those who went who, on the shoulder of those who went before me and so therefore I want my back and shoulders to be strong so that I can hold up the next generation so that they can see again that they can do what I'm doing but even take it to a whole another height yes it's great um, you know I love what I do and I love uh, events and I, I like what the business does but ultimately it gives me the freedom to my end goal, right, is to have the freedom to make an impact with the people in my life so I have a job that allows me to pay my bills and have flexibility uh, so that I can, you know, spend time with my, my family and my friends and really make an impact there. So I just want y'all to know, I just got an email from Southwest, so I'm pretty sad now. Like, I don't even want to, I don't even want to open it. My watch went off. I said Southwest. I said, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> No, thank you. Girl, right you now. a believer. No, thank you right now. Um, but my end goal, uh, ultimately, I mean, I have tons of end goals, but the one that I think is most prominent right now um, is eliminating a, leg a legacy of debt and creating a legacy of wealth for my family, something my family has never, ever seen. Um, I'm the first person in my family to own a home. That's crazy to yes. me. Yes. Crazy insane. Um, so that, that literally is one of my big goals is eliminate debt, create le a legacy of wealth. So. Wow, wasn't this amazing? Like, oh my gosh, goose a bumps, total goose bumps. So this is what I will say in closing, like this morning has been awesome. I want each and every one of you to go and live your very best life throughout the rest of the day. And just keep in mind that when somebody asks you what you came to this world to do, be committed to living out loud always. Thank you so very much for being here this morning. Go be bold, be brave, and be creative.